So thanks everybody for joining us uh, for this panel. So we had a great discussion earlier. So we 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 learned more about end-to-end -end, uh, digitization in investment. We talked about front office, back office, the value chain, and uh, data and how tech can be uh, an enabler. So today we are going to deep dive on the the path to customer-centric business model and more efficient uh, banking and wealth management. So we have experts here. We have uh, different companies, consulting, banking, and I will let our experts introduce themselves. So please, Shane. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I need uh, help with technology, although I work for a bank that is uh, driven by technology. Uh, so my name is Shane O'Neill. I'm the head of sales and key clients for Swissquote Bank in Europe. I, for the last almost 20 years, I was working in wealth management, mainly in private banking uh, on the B2B, uh, B2C side uh, and a little bit on the B2B. Uh, and now I've made the switch over to, uh, I would suppose, how to describe Swissquote, a technology company that does banking. So we do things a little bit different in Swissquote and it's, uh, it's, it's nice we're reinventing um, how banking is done and we're not uh, afraid to change it. Um, so I'll uh, yeah, look forward to discussing uh, many topics today. Great, thank you Shane. Oh, yeah. Welcome so back Yvonne. Welcome again. <laughs> Um, so I'm replacing Ian. Have you already told about it? No. Unfortunately, my colleague got uh, stuck um, at the airport in London yesterday evening and we had no chance to get him here. So yeah, just imagine I'm Ian. So perhaps so more words about me than I said before because in the role of a moderator, I didn't want to talk so much about me. Um, as already said, um, leading the capital markets area for ASG at Accenture. To be honest, before joining, uh, I'm not that, that I'm not so uh, so long at Accenture. Actually, since April last year, and before I spent um, 12 years at a mid-sized consultancy, and uh, before joining the consulting industry, I also gathered um, experience within investment banking. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm uh, Jean-Baptiste Beau. I work for uh, Comarche. Um, I come from the business part of uh, the financial industry because I've uh, I work um, I've worked uh, for one year in Luxembourg for a depository bank. Uh, then I decided to switch to the more of the the tech part. Um, I've worked uh, three years in Brussels for a French IT consulting company for bank and uh, insurances uh, clients. And now, uh, since uh, one year now, I work for Comarche, uh, which is a software house uh, company. And uh, yeah, I kind of help uh, support a company, um, financial institutions, uh, to um, into their uh, yeah um, big transformation, digital transformation processes, um, and uh, by offering them digital tools um, to help them to increase uh, the way they manage clients, customers, the way they manage their portfolios uh, of the customers um, and the interactions um, mainly, I mean, digital, human and hybrid um, uh, discussion between clients and, uh, and customers. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Goodrich. Um, I've been working in f financial services and technology for 35 years. Um, first came to Luxembourg in '93, working for an investment bank that had just acquired a, a small private bank. Um, this is my second tour of duty at ERI, um, and we are the provider of one of the leading core systems in the wealth management marketplace. Great, so thanks uh, all for the introduction. Uh, as you see, we have a wealthy panel, a lot of experiences. Uh, needless to say, adopting a customer-centric approach brings a lot of uh, benefits. So it improves the customer experience and uh, profitability in many cases. So with that, I would like to get your perspective from each of you. So let's start uh, with Ivan. What's your perspective on this uh, customer-centricity trends Experience, because um, indeed I had several projects um, around um, customer-centric business model changes, and it's always important 
as an industry player to have a clear view. Who are my clients? Who are my customers? Because they have different needs. And if this kind or this sort of work has been done before, it's always very difficult then to implement the right stuff. It's, it's also a question about how to find, if you're not building it from uh, by your own, which to be honest, in the meantime, isn't the best way anymore. And if you then uh, are looking for, for, for any providers to support you, it's also important to find the right provider. The provider has to fit to the culture of uh, you, you as a bank, as a wealth manager. And then again, in the end, okay, I come, I'm coming from consulting, I have to say it, it's about having a proper program project management, yeah? Because otherwise, you will lose complete control. Great. Thank you. Shane, you want to go? Yes. Please. Well, at Swissquo, we actually looked at doing it very different. Uh, we said, okay, how can we re-engineer banking uh, as a bank, how can we do things different from the very beginning? Uh, what do clients want? What do they what do they look for in terms of pricing, execution, uh, real-time information? Uh, so things in Swiss code are actually, well, the majority of the things we do build. Uh, we start from the beginning. We look how to uh, reverse engineer, uh, look, look at building from the ground up. Uh, that could mean from advanced trading systems to real-time quotes to uh, uh, execution on on various products. Uh, so it was it was looking at the banking industry as a whole, and then then trying to uh, build off that and focusing on the wealth management side. Uh, so when, when we when we look at things, uh, there's you know, 1,200 employees in our in our company. Um, about 30% of those are software engineers on the technology side, which is very different to other banks I've worked in, you know, in the past where technology is is part of the bank, but, but a much smaller part. Uh, we see it as the core of our bank, um, and that's that's how we we build out and constantly looking at, uh, at at focusing on what clients want and then building it for them. Great, thank you so much. Alan, you have been working in the field for more than 30 years. What's your perspective <laughs> yes. here? So, uh, as I mentioned, I first came here in 93. We just acquired a, a private bank. And, I mean, even back then, 30 years ago, the the hot topic was how to be customer-centric. This is not a new thing that uh, or object objective that we're trying to achieve. I think, and I like the analogy from the, the first panel of, of the restaurant, I think a lot of institutions still focus on the customer experience and you know, putting a lot of effort and uh, the expense that goes with that into, into the window dressing, as, as Patricia said. Um, but they're not really looking at their, their core still. And the, the kitchen is still uh, product-centric. It's not customer-centric. So... Um, I mean, I think that's really where where a lot of institutions have to to go back to basics, and uh, and this is how they have to get started. They have to to move away from this this idea of being product centric and measuring their their profitability and their revenue through products, which unfortunately our charts of accounts are often built that way, um, to being you know measuring it all via the the customer and what segment the customer is in and what segment of their wealth you're actually dealing with and what uh, you know with the new generation as well i mean if you go back to going to the restaurant you're probably working out which of your dishes is the most profitable but you're not working out which of your customers are the most profitable and attracting more of those profitable customers the ones that are coming more often and buying more than so that would be my, my take on you know, how you get started is to shift that Great. perception. Thank you so much. So Jean-Baptiste, you are on the field. Yeah. You deal with your customer to get it done. What's yeah. your perspective Thank on you. this? Thank you. So yeah, first, how do we get started? Um, I think, and it already has mentioned before, um, we start with data. We start by identifying clients, um, understand them, the needs, preferences, uh, the stages in their lives, the pain points as well. 
So that's really the, the starting point on how to be customer centric um, in order for uh, after um, to be in a process of tailoring uh, product services and to provide personalized experiences to the customers. So that's really the, the starting point. Um, what I would like to mention as well um, regarding to being customer centric uh, as a business is that this process is an ongoing process. It's not a one-time project or uh, whatsoever. It's an ongoing process because markets are moving fast. Technologies as well, the technology side of the of uh, of the business is moving so fast. So that's um, that's something that has to be implemented um, through 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 the years and not at one time as a single project or whatsoever. And then uh, at the end of the day, being customer centric means um, that um, you can build long-term relationships with your customers within banking or wealth management uh, world. Um, and it really helps. Uh, and wh wh what we see with our um, customers, financial institution, we see that it helps to build trust uh, among their clients. Great. Thank you so much. So what we learn, it's really start to understand who is the customer, what are the needs, how can we imp improve the experience while generating revenue at the top line and bottom line. So uh, in the prior panel even, you touch about talents and uh, you just talk about governance. So what does it really take to become customer centric? Good, good questions. Um, it starts with having the right people on board, people who are really thrilled about delivering best service to clients. This is at least my view. And um, I'm currently advising uh, a German asset manager, still a small one, um, absolutely self-independent, and you can imagine this asset manager still works a bit in the classical way. So, and this is really interesting to see because at the moment you have two generations working for this, um, for this asset managers. The really experienced portfolio managers who still want to pick up the phone, reaching the client immediately, a bit hesitating, for example, to use a CRM like Microsoft Dynamics. And on the other side, you have a, a, a team of very agile young people who are also responsible for a digital solution this asset manager uh, recently launched. And um, I mean in the end, and this is also something which is not you, it's also about bringing experience and expertise of both generations together especially in those times. That's, that's my experience. Yeah? And uh, I know I said it before, but I love the slogan, it's toned from the top, which in the end, of course, it's easier when you are a small independent asset manager because in the end, it's the, it's the money of the owner. Yeah? And in, in this case, it works, but of course, also in, um, in the, in the um, leadership of this asset manager, we now see a slow change. So, as I said before, it, it comes and goes with the people, with the right people. Great, thank you, Ivan. Alan, do you want to add to this? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the panelists have already talked about it. It's, uh, it's also about really getting, going back to the basics. And uh, I mean, s over, the, over the years, we have uh, better quality of data, better quantity of data that we're capturing. You know, regulations are also forcing that with what we need to know about the clients in terms of KYC with MIFID 2 you know we're capturing a lot of data are we really using it are we really using it to know better um, you know which clients are profitable why are they profitable what is the the latent opportunity in those clients because you know some of the new technology available in terms of AI and analytics you know, you can look at behavior and you can say, okay, well, these clients, because of the way they're, op they're interacting with us, that would lead us to believe that maybe most of their wealth is actually somewhere else. And so there's, there's great opportunities, I think, in the data that is being captured and it's not really being leveraged yet. That's a very good point. Uh, Shane, please. Yeah, just to uh, continue on that point, it, you know, it's, it is about capturing information about clients. 
uh, how to deal with them. You know, if if I look at uh, dealing with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, if we were just a digital bank and we didn't have a physical presence and people just saw themselves as a number rather than um, an actual person, we, we, we can't forget who they actually are. Um, the, the digital side or the technology side certainly helps with making it more efficient, but you have to remember who the client is. Uh, you have to you have to gather information on them. You have to be a person that they can speak to, that they can come and see in the bank. So it's, it, it is super important that we not only uh, look at managing our clients from a digital perspective, but also that, that human side. Um, and as we build and grow with our clients, we analyze what profitability they bring, um, how we can continue to make them make sure them, uh, they are happy. We, we specialize in providing relationship management to them but we have to look at what is why they came to us in the first place and they came to us uh, because of our platform because of our product offering where where Alan spoke earlier it was uh, he, he was speaking about um, you know the, the bank sometimes we have wealth managers or banks offering specific products uh, where they can generate more revenue rather than providing the full platform. Now, as we grow, as information grows, people get to understand. They know, uh, they will get to learn that, look, uh, ETF tracking the S&P 500 will perform most likely 80-90% uh, of the time better than um, an asset manager over the space of 10 years. So then, then as people begin to learn, they get, begin to understand. They they see banks okay that you're you're pushing particular products that are more beneficial for you. So they'll be just pushed out to go somewhere else. Yes, they may not be the most profitable for the bank to sell at the time, but ultimately you do have to have that full offering for the clients because the more knowledgeable the clients gets, the less likely they are to stay with you if if they see that you're pushing. A product rather than giving them the full offering that's in the in the market right thank you that's a great example how data help the, the customer to benefit from a product uh, Jean-Baptiste yeah uh, I think that's very important that uh, Shane uh, just said uh, being uh, understand the client before being a, a digital uh, bank um, I think um, first of all as we mentioned earlier that's the, the, the main point, understand the client. Uh, do we get the, the right data? Um, can we analyze the data on the, the right way? Um, in order for um, this client preferences, needs, uh, and so whatsoever, to put them all in the center of all um, business decision processes. Uh, and that's the main point. Then you can go uh, more digital, you can serve clients uh, on a hybrid way, for example, because we see, um, for example, we had the case with a, a big private bank from Italy that we work with uh, in seven countries. We see that even though the clients are private customers, they really like to um, interact digitally to access um, um, without no time to their data, to reporting, to um, KYC, MIFI2 surveys, uh, et cetera, uh, to interact with their uh, bankers, uh, wealth managers, but to have a phys um, physical, as well, a physical space that they can share with their uh, bankers. So that's, that's the main point. Um, and then, Communication as well is really important. We, we, we talk about this um, during the precedent panel that transparency is as well something that is really important to put the customer at the center of all decision making processes, transparency. And what we see being digital is that the customer can access real time data, real time reporting whatsoever. And um, at the end of the day, being hybrid, means that the client can be more autonomous. I mean, some part of, uh, of the journey can be autonomous. Another one still has to be managed by um, the advisors. And on the other side, the advisors can be um, more productive because they can really focus on more high value tasks, serving the client, giving advice to the client, rather than 
administrative repetitive tasks that can be handled by um, autonomous uh, robotization AI uh, technologies. Great. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Alan? Yes, but uh, I would like you to touch on the profitability aspect. So we talk about the product. Uh, Shane has developed, you know, how we improve the experiences, the loyalty of the customer. So I know profitability is a, is a topic <laughs> you like to touch on. So Well, yeah, I mean, I think so going back to, yeah, to not just my point, but uh, the points of, of other panelists already today, it's knowing your, your customer and knowing which ones are profitable and, you know, going back even to the 90s, there was uh, a lot of institutions that thought, okay, we, we now want to uh, democratize mm -hmm. wealth management. We want to go lower, well, further down the pyramid um, to go into the mass affluent market, for example, with the same products and services. And it didn't really work because there's no point, and even today, there's no point in having a really nice, seamless digital onboarding if all you're doing is onboarding clients that are not profitable. That doesn't help anybody. You know, we're still in this business to try and make money. So <laughs> we have stakeholders and shareholders to keep happy. So, you know, the investment in, in technology needs to be focused on, and you need to be customer-centric and know who you want to target with what. Otherwise, you're going to be blindly, and one of the CIOs earlier said that it's easy to go to the board and get investment for, you know, for the sexy stuff on the front end. But is that really going to drive profitability? Yeah. Great, thank you. So we have, we have discussed uh, how com consumer centricity is providing a better customer experience, profitability, efficiency through robotization. But as you know, it's a path, and there is challenges, there is friction, there is change to be done inside the organization. So now I would like uh, our panel to, to share their experiences, and so we can all benefit how to get started. Uh, Yvonne, you have so many customers, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> about all this experience. So uh, some I have already mentioned and uh, of course my, my observation is that it's in general easier when the client has a, a decent size in order to not lose control. I would like to phrase it like that yeah, because of course the large players and I said it in the panel before they are still working more in a in a silo-focused way. Uh, of course, they're also learning and learning and learning. So, so therefore, I think at the moment, it's always easier to start such, such projects um, if you have a size that can be controlled. That, that's, that's the one point. If you are a larger player, it really has to be organized very well from the beginning. You have to have the stakeholders on board because otherwise you lose a lot of time, you have a lot of discussions, meetings to in the end um, yeah, clarify also quite often very, very simple stuff. So this is more the, the, the project view. Again here because I'm coming from a very functional view, so I, I, I worked in investment banking and brokerage, also in wealth management. For me it's always important to, even though we are talking about technology, you have to have the right um, tech guys, how I love to call them, but you also have to have the people who really understand the business. Because otherwise you will just implement another technology resulting in an, in resulting in a solution that, that can be fantastic, that can look sexy, but it does not meet the client's uh, needs and expectations. And sometimes less is more. Again, coming back to the point, it's depending on your client. And then I had another thought and I lost it. <laughs> I, I will come back to it, I will think about it. Alan, would you like to add on this, please? Yeah, so, um I mean, I th uh, Patricia mentioned it in the first panel as well, that, uh, and it, it relates also again to the, the restaurant analogy. Uh, there, are, you know, there are some institutions that are relatively new and we're in a fortunate position where they were not starting with maybe 
big legacy systems that they, you know, it, it's like a kitchen that you, you want to produce nice new dishes out of the kitchen, but you're still using equipment that is 10, 15, 20 years old. It's not going to be easy. Um, and as Patricia said, sometimes you have to bite the bullet and, I mean, you do need to change your, your core in order to be able to even leverage what the fintechs can do, the sexy stuff can do. Because without open APIs and all this kind of stuff, you can't really leverage it, you can't get the efficiencies. It's, you're just going to end up with a spaghetti that costs you even more to, to produce <laughs> what you want to produce. So, um, you know, that's really one key message, I think, it was a message from the first panel as well. Um, and the other is, also I think came in, into the, the first panel, is really you need, you know, I think we all have a pretty clear vision of where we want to get to. But a lot of institutions don't really know where they're starting from, especially the big ones with, with legacy platforms, etc. And that's also another message is you, you need to know your customers and your technology to know where you're starting from. The path to get to where you want to get to is impossible if you don't know where you're starting from. Great. Yes, please, Ivan. So one business area department that is quite often kind of neglected when we talk about such larger transformation projects is compliance and legal. Mm -hmm. I know they can be challenging, exhausting. On the other side, they are n normally com completely right when we look at the regulatory side. So when I also implemented a lot of regulatory stuff, therefore I can quite good and quite well understand them. And in the end, it's better to um, involve them at the very early beginning of such projects or programs to really make sure that you are compliant with all the regulatory stuff. Doesn't matter if you are located in Germany, Luxembourg, London, wherever. Because if you find out that something is missing in a new, in a new application or a new uh, client front, for example, once it has gone live, that, that can be really painful. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Jean-Baptiste? Um, well, to come back to the question, what are the, the main challenges? I would say the first one is uh, because being customer-centric changes the whole culture of, the, of, of a company, of financial institution, so you have to bring all the stakeholders on board as you mentioned, Yvonne, um, change the mindsets, the way we process, the way we work, the way we behave, we do business, and that's have to bring everyone towards the same point. So that's the, the, the I think, the main challenge. Um, then the challenge as well, and we, we mentioned several times uh, earlier, that's the data. How do we get the right data? How do we analyze the right data? What do we do with, the, with this data? Um, and then when the business uh, is drove toward more uh, business-centric processes, how do we measure uh, the success? Um, how do we quantify customer satisfaction, uh, customer loyalty? So we have to ask ourselves these questions. Um, and then the last point, uh, coming back to the digitalization, uh, yeah, it's a whole new way of thinking, of operating, and um, I would mention, um, as uh, Patricia Kerkhoff uh, said earlier, IT must serve business and not the other way around. Great. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Shane, please. Over to me. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I think if I, you know, what's what's normal now would have been impossible, n not that long ago. If if I think when I started in banking 20 years ago, client walks in, uh, or you go see a client, they want to buy a particular stock, a fund, a, uh, a trade a bond, whatever it may be. They'd fill out a subscription form, uh, they'd sign the document in your presence. Uh, then that will be sent for processing, it will be done probably the next day. You most likely missed the cutoff of that day. Then that moved on to uh, great technology like fax machines where they'd actually fax it in, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, 
And uh, at one stage we got with clients where they were saying, look, how do you even work a fax machine? I was like, I don't know. Um, and then, then we advanced on to scanning documents by email. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, doing recorded line callbacks. And then after that, we, we got to like straight up recorded lines or, or emails. Uh, now I look at how we do it in, in our bank. Uh, if a client wants to buy Amazon today, they pick up their phone, uh, you do the facial recognition, you press the amount of shares you want to buy at that particular price, and, and bang, it's done. It's instant, it's live, it's straight away. So if someone had told me that 20 years ago, I'd say, are you mad? Um, like, a, you know, that te technology doesn't exist. So as, as what we see now is, as difficult in the future, it's, it's the norm. Um, so we look at it that way and, okay, how to be ahead of the curve and as some of the panelists here mentioned, you know, it, it is expensive. Uh, so if you do have some very old archaic systems, it's, it's not the easiest to do. Thankfully for us, you know, a lot of our systems are more advanced. So we actually go out, we, we go to wealth managers, we go to banks. Um, we let them Im implement our system, uh, be it on the white labeling or be it on SQ Professional for uh, for asset managers, etc., like that. So rather than create your own um, interface and your own software, uh, you can use w what's out there. Um, and it is look, it is a challenge, and uh, I, you know it, it's going to take a while to change existing systems to new systems, change existing ways, policies, procedures. Like all of these things have to be re rewritten, but. If it doesn't start from the top, and if that culture isn't implemented, uh, people are going to lose clients. And as clients, the, the very young clients now, uh, you know, the 20-year-olds, the 30-year-olds, are, are they really going to want to uh, go fill out a form and send it by fax? Well, I don't know if there's still some doing fax, but I'm sure there is out there. Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you ask a 20-year-old today uh, to use a fax machine, uh, they'd, uh, they'd be a bit lost. Well, yeah, look, uh, that's one of the challenges. Now, uh, one of the other main challenges we see, of course, is people. It was spoken about in the previous panel. Uh, recruiting these days is difficult. Uh, you have some uh, employees that want to do the same job every day and repeat. Um, some employees who, who want a challenge. And then there's a lot of jobs, especially in client services, wealth management, uh, where you may have 90% of the of the work is the same, but then that 10% are completely left field, and you know the client has really thrown you off, and it's it's not something you have the answer to. Um, some people that work in client servicing like that challenge. Others think it's you know it's extremely extremely uh, difficult, and it makes them very uncomfortable. Um, so that's that's certainly another one. Thank you so much. So we heard a lot about uh, culture, people, technology, but also we understand that we need to get to know the customer. We need to understand internally where we are today, where we want to go tomorrow, sometime anticipating technology trend. So I would like to finalize our panel today to talk about culture. It's such a difficult topic to address, a lot of friction organization. So could you please share your experience, how you manage to get people on board and going in the same way toward this path? Well, if you go to the Swiss Court headquarters in Glond, uh, on the ground floor, there's a bar, uh, just a normal pub. Uh, and every employee has one free drink, at least after work. Um, if you walk into our offices here in summertime, people can wear shorts. Uh, you know, you know the, the culture, you know, you have to have a culture where people feel relaxed working. Okay, I've worked in many big banks and uh, I think some people in them would have a heart attack if they, if they saw a culture of that. But, you know, if, if you want to be that bit different, if you want to, if you want to change it, if, if you want to go with the flow, it's fine, you're there, you go with the flow, the majority are in the flow, but if you want to do things a little bit differently, that's where you've you, you, you got to be creative. Uh, you got, you've you got to have a different type of culture, a culture where people, you know, uh, they're, they're comfortable working. We just set up a new office in, in Zurich and uh, in, one of the off, uh, in one of the rooms, chill out room, they put a PlayStation 5. 
a again, I'm not sure too many banks would put a PlayStation 5 in a, 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 in a room, but it makes people more likely to work there. And then that feeds back to the clients. You know, we're, we're constantly doing client surveys. What do they want? What products do they want? What are they happy with, not happy with? I think, you know, you, you have to feed that back and the clients then will, will tell you and ultimately you have to f have a place where uh, people are happy to work. Great, thank you so much. Yvonne, please. How much time do we have? So for me, culture is very much linked to what we discussed before, the war for talents, yeah? Because the new generation also requires more from us as an employer, and it's also the, the, the case for us as a consultancy, as Accenture. And from a leadership perspective, you have to act as a role model. I'm completely convinced. Of course, I'm not every day a role model. Yeah, I also have my bad days, but um, it it definitely helps if if the if, if your people feel that you are in the end uh, yeah working for the same objective. You are pursuing the same goal, and this is of course the same I am um, experienced with my clients. And coming back again to this wonderful asset manager, it is easier if you are a bank that is still led by, by a leadership that um, yeah, is really engaged um, with, the, with the personal fortune, to phrase it like that. Uh, you really feel in this, in this uh, example that uh, the, the people feel connected to the, to the board of this asset manager. And in the end, bigger banks have to be able to kind of um, uh, tra transport this example in the different areas, business units. I mean, if you are responsible for, for an area, for a business unit, you have to behave the same from my point of view. And um, as I also said before, it's also bringing for me the generations together. Yes. And it's also accepting perhaps that people are different. So not everybody wants to pursue a career. There are people that just want to do their job eight hours a day and then it's and quite often you need them because they are doing an important job perhaps fr from a reporting perspective from a back office perspective and you also have to give those people the feeling that they are well you too and then you can for example play with features you have just described yeah bringing also people together now and then i'm finished i promise i'm coming back to to the younger generation they want us as, as leader also to be much more engaged. So 10 years ago, when I still was a manager and wanted to talk to my partner at the consultancy, yeah, I, I, I was really polite and uh, really humble. Today, they sent you an email. If you don't have the time to answer immediately, next day, second email, Yvonne, when do you have time? And you have to, to, to find the, the right mixture in between. And they are also much more um, expecting from you as a leader. And as I just said, I think it's, it's finding a, a good balance. Great. Thank Finished. you so much. Alan and Jean-Baptiste, are your final thoughts on that? Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think... I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as a, a generation thing, actually. I think people are just different people and you know, like to work different ways. Um, I mean, I was, I was just thinking back to when I was just starting out, this big investment bank I worked for, they actually around Big Bang in the UK, they decided to split the firm into two. So basically there was going to be the brokerage side and the securities side. So one was B2C and the other one was basically B2B. And the, the heads, or the, the ones who were going to be the future heads of each side, they actually presented to the staff and gave the staff the choice. And I think, so it's, you need to know where you're starting from too. And if you're working already in a very big institution with a lot of people, um, some of the culture you will not be able to change and maybe don't want to because there's still maybe customers that like that old culture too. So maybe you need to start like a greenfield entity and basically the customers that are drawn towards the greenfield entity will be drawn to that. And also likewise your staff. You basically you identify the staff, whatever age they are, that fit the culture of that new way of working and that new type of client. Great. Thank you.
Um, if I come back to the to the initial question uh, about the culture and how do we make it uh, a reality, um, I think first of all, so because it brings lots of changes, as we mentioned, for the whole organization, and I think we have to, and as you mentioned even before, less is better. So you have to really, um, yeah, go with small changes, small stuff that you can implement quickly and even change quickly if it doesn't work. So I think that's a whole starting point of uh, going towards this culture. Um, then you have the financial institutions have to have to, uh, a clear vision, a clear strategy. So what does that mean for us being customer centric? Um, what does that imply? How do we measure it afterwards? So that this is the questions that uh, the institution have to ask themselves. And um, yeah, to, to to conclude, I would say that um, if we if we if we see two sides, so the employees and the customers. So on one side, you have to empower employees to go towards this culture by giving them the right trainings, right tools. And on the other side, you have to involve customers, as I mentioned, um, to bring them in the center of all decision-making processes. Great. So thank you so much for all the panelists. Uh, thanks for sharing your wealth of experiences. Uh, we covered a lot today. We talked about the customer, the approach, the governance, how to get it done. There is a lot to digest, and uh, I do believe we need to have the right partners. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to our panel participants if you have any questions. Thank you so much. My first question is, um, do you have example where um, IT, where uh, building some something uh, is uh, was not um, useful, you know? Um, I don't want, I don't, know how to explain this but do you have one concrete example where um, using IT uh, was not relevant this direction um, large German banks several years ago implemented a new core system I also was part of the program around two years later it was the other way around again and I mean, this course system was in the end meant to um, facilitate the, the, the big German bank as well as one of the largest subsidiaries. And two years later, they decided again that two, two, the, both, uh, the two entities should have separate IT architectures. It, it has a name, I will not mention it now. So, so those, those of you who are more experienced know the example. And that was really, really a pain and a mess also for all the um, employers <laughs> and also a bit for the consultancies. Hi, I'm Christoph uh, Franklin Templeton. Thank you for your insights. Uh, just a very quick question. Um, open banking seems to be a very interesting path uh, to enhance uh, customer centricity because it will eventually spur innovation. It will decrease costs. Um, how do you see that developing and having uh, an impact on client centricity as such? Another, another very good question. Um, in the wealth management space, um, I think, again, this goes back to, to segmenting the wealth pyramid of a client. And for sure, there is the, you know, the top part that they probably want to do a lot more self-serve. And uh, connecting yourself to platforms that uh, you know that use open banking and do aggregation and allow self-serve of you know trading and buying funds and things like that. It's go it's of course it's going to be interesting and it probably makes you more sticky as a wealth manager. Is it going to make you money as a wealth manager? Only because it makes you more sticky and the deeper you can go down the wealth pyramid of a client presumably more profitable that client is going to be. But in itself, probably not a profitable exercise. If, if all the client does is use you for that, then it's not, uh, not that interesting for wealth managers, I would say. 
uh, yeah, of course. Uh, j- just just to add on that, uh, like as you said, uh, as as you offer more products, you certainly get more clients. Um, be it. Uh, across the whole spectrum of wealth management. Now, how do you implement that uh, to make it more profitability? If you're just a pure broker, uh, then you're relying just on brokerage fees. If you're focused on one particular asset class, well, you know, being very open across that, then then you know, if if you're just selling crypto, for example, or crypto trading, but as we try to do, it's 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 more on okay, we're we're a pure bank as well. So if people use this for the banking side, if they use this for the trading side, uh, we try to be open across everything. Uh, so it's not just, you know, focus on one particular area, but the more you have, the stickier they can be, which is uh, which is key. Great. great. Sorry, we are running out of time. Uh, thank you so much for those great questions and uh, feel free to connect with us. <laughs>